Open your Bibles, if you would, please, to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, this morning we're going to be working through verses 1 through 20. And today we are starting a new sermon series, just for a couple weeks. It's called, Lord, Make Me a Servant. So over these next couple weeks, we're going to be looking at the example of Jesus' servant leadership. And it's going to be a call to action to God's people gathered here this morning, but I hope that you will see the way that Jesus served, and that you would model that in your own life. Look at the way that He served others and apply that to your own life, in your own service. You know, it was A.W. Tozer, the great A.W. Tozer, who said that there is an entire generation of Christian that's being raised who thinks it's possible to accept Christ without turning from this world, without forsaking the world and I find that to be absolutely true and correct. But the question then becomes, what does forsaking this world actually look like? It's a reasonable question. And in answering this, we can start with the understanding that the life that Jesus calls us to is the exact opposite of the self-serving nature of this world. I mean, you understand this, right? You understand this? Sadly, today, on Sunday... In churches all across America, people will come in with this Americanized consumer mentality hoping to get things from God. When the reality is that the Christian life is about dying to your own wants. That's what the Christian life is about. But yet we come to church and we're like, God, what can you give me? Instead of the question being, God, what can I give back to you? And that's what we're going to be looking at here today, looking at service towards others, using Jesus' example. But I recently read some commentary from a theologian who was talking about current events and the state of the individual Christian in our modern world. And he said, you know, in Afghanistan right now, I mean, we all know what's going on in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, Christians are ready to die for the cause of Christ. And here in America, we're trying to teach Christians to live for Christ. You see the contrast there? There they're ready to die for the cause of Christ. Here, we're still trying to convince Christians to live for Christ. What does it look like to live for Christ? You know, Jesus said that if you desire to follow Him, you'll take up your cross daily. You'll pick up your cross daily and follow Him. And part of picking up your cross is service to others. Service to God through serving others. You know, the reality of the situation is we're all servants. You're already a servant. The question is, who do you serve? Do you serve yourself or do you serve God? That's the question. You know, it's my sincere hope that this church would be marked by immense service. That people outside this congregation would look at West Hills Baptist and say, those people know what it's like to serve. That's my hope. Be marked with service. Service to one another. Service to our community. And service with a heart towards pleasing God. So pray with me if you would please as we start our message here this morning. Father God, we thank you for the privilege of gathering here today. Thank you for the freedom we have to worship you and look into your word. Thank you that we can see Jesus' love manifested through service here in this text. We ask you, Father, that your holy presence would fill this place. Meet us here and move and convict as only you can. Be our teacher here this morning. We ask this in the name that is above all names, the name of Jesus. Amen. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. So before we get into our text this morning, allow me to set some context. Because as I've said before, text without context becomes pretext. If you don't know the context of what's happening, somebody could lead you down a wrong road into a wrong theology. And it's my job to protect you from that, so I want to set some context. You see, John chapters 13 through 17 is what's known as the upper room discourse. And these chapters make up about 25% of John's entire gospel. And you see, John chapters 1 through 12 
focus on Jesus' first three and a half years of ministry. But chapters 13 through 17 look at one night. And see here what's going on. Jesus' public ministry is over. It's over. It's concluded. And here he is preparing his disciples for what must happen. He's preparing them for the things that must come. And here in verses 1 through 3 of John chapter 13, we see that Jesus knew that his time had come. In fact, we read from verse 1, Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And there are many things that we need to note here in the text. The first is that John records that it was the night before Passover. And of course, we know Passover to be Israel's deliverance from Egypt. And it's that celebration. And you can read all about that in Exodus chapter 12 through 14. But there's more that I hope you understand with Passover. See, the biblical scholar John Meyer, he notes that if we adhere to the timeline laid out in John's gospel, Jesus would have been crucified at the exact hour that the Passover lambs were being sacrificed. The picture of our Passover lamb being sacrificed for us is essential. It's essential since John notes what Jesus does when he knows that his time has come. He serves. And here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. We see the word loved here in the text. And this is the Greek word agapaho. And you've heard me talk about agape love before. You know what that's all about. Well, this is the same thing. This is a different verb, noun, tenses. But this word, agapao, in John chapters 1 through 12 is used seven times. But in John chapter 13 through 17, it's used 30 times. There is such an emphasis placed by the author onto this text about love and action. Love and action. Jesus' love manifests in action, and he does it through service. John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he uses this word 30 times to say, do you get the point? Do you get the point? 25% of John's gospel. We see it here, but there's more that I want you to note. The text says that he loved them to the end. Now, here's something that you don't hear me say a lot. Is I actually prefer the way the NIV translates this. All right. You probably won't hear me say that many more times, but I do. You know, oftentimes in my sermon preparation, I'll read the same text through multiple translations. And when I read the NIV this time, it actually it impacted me. I kind of had to just take my hands off the keyboard and just kind of stop and, and think. He showed them the full extent of their love. It reads like this, having loved his own who are in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. It impacted me. It's the idea that Jesus could not have done anything more to show his love. Jesus showed them the full extent of his love. And here's the thing. He did so despite Satan putting betrayal into the heart of Judas. We see it in verse 2. I direct your eyes to the text in verse 2 as well as verse 27. Jesus knew the condition of Judas, and yet he still poured out his love for him. I find it incredible, and our churches today are going to be so full of people who are in open rebellion against God. Our churches are going to be so full of Christians who are betraying the life that God has called them to. And why is it that so many people call ourselves Christians, but we don't want to give up our sins? Why is that? And I just want you to know that if you're here today and you're betraying the life that God has called you to, or you're not living up to the man or the woman that God has created you to be, you're going to have a fresh start here this morning. You're going to have a fresh start. You don't get many fresh starts through life, but you can have one here this morning. If your life has been marked by shame and suffering, you can have a fresh start. Last week we talked about shame being turned into a trophy of God's grace. And he can do that for you here this morning. You can have a fresh start. You can have the Passover blood of our sacrificial lamb imputed and pressed upon your life. Why? Because Jesus showed you the full extent of his love. On the cross, his full measure of love on the cross. And he showed Judas the full extent 
of his love as well. And that's the example that I'm calling you here to today, church. That's the example. You know, Jesus sat at the table with his betrayer, knew what was coming, and still poured out every last measure of his love. And if we were to continue in the text farther, you would see that Judas is most likely sitting in the position of honor when Jesus breaks the bread and say, here, do what you must. We're not going to get there today, but Judas is in the position of honor. And I find it beautiful that Jesus knows Judas, and yet he is still pursuing him. Isn't that incredible, church? Last Sunday, we saw that Jesus is still in the business of pursuing sinners. Today, right now, he is still in the business of pursuing sinners. And praise God for that. You know why? Because I was dead in my sin. And you were dead in your sin. But yet God is pursuing you because he poured out his love, the full measure and extent of his love for you. And maybe you've never been loved like that in your life. But Jesus Christ gave himself entirely for you. And I hope, church, that you never get tired of thinking about that. God help you if those words ever hit your ears and you're just like, God forgive you. Those words should move you to action. It's beautiful that Jesus knows Judas and yet he still pursues them. Jesus is in the business of pursuing sinners today and you know some of you are being pursued here this morning some of you are being pursued here this morning you may not even know it you may not even know it but I pray that the hounds of heaven get a hold of you and bring you to your knees because you can't shake them you know there was a great poem in 1893 written by I believe it's Philip Thompson called the hound of heaven talks about the unrelenting love of God for you. I pray that that love chases you down and drags you to your knees because you are not outside God's grace. You think, well, you don't know where I've been, what I've seen. No, but I know Jesus. And I know that His sufficient blood can cover your sins, cover your past. You are not outside God's grace. And how loving is God that He gives you every opportunity all the way to the end that he pursues you to the very end how loving is God come on church how loving is God every opportunity all the way to the end you know I got to be honest with you I believe that Jesus washed Judas's feet but where was betrayal put it's there in verse 2 it was put into his heart and what does this tell me? What does this tell you? Well, as expositors of the text, we need to draw the correlation that ritualism without a heart for Jesus is nothing. You get that? Ritualism without a heart for Jesus is nothing. What good is baptism if you haven't been regenerated by the Holy Spirit? What good is it? Nothing. And this begs the question, where is your heart today? Where is your heart today? Are you just going through the motions? Because grandma went to church, I'm going to come to church, and that's what she did. Or do you come to church desiring the glory of God above all things? And you just have to have it. Do you get excited on Saturday night? Where's your heart? In verse 3, in verse 3, we see the words knowing or knew for the second time in three verses. And John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wants you to see that Jesus knew his time would come. The realization, the fact that the moment was at hand, and yet he served. But notice also in verse 3 that Jesus knew that all things were given into his hands. And this reminds me of Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, where all authority in heaven and on earth was given to Jesus. And what does the one who has authority over all things do. What does he do? He washes the disgusting, stinky feet of his sinful disciples. 
I'm just going to let that permeate for a second. How beautiful is the person of Jesus. How loving is the person of Jesus. And how incredibly great is our God, church. How great is our God. And you know, when I sit down and I pray and say, God, show me what you want me to teach on and preach on this Sunday. And I sit down and I write up these sermon outlines. My goal is not to hear the words, wow, what a great message. My goal is to hear, what a great God. What a great God. To get you to leave here in a state of worship each and every Sunday. You didn't come here for a pep talk or a motivational speech. You came here for the glory of God. At least I hope you did. I hope you did. And it's because of this fact that God is so great that we can see a truth that we can hold on to. You ready for this truth? Jesus knew exactly who he was. Jesus was on a mission, and he knew who he was, and there was security in that. So loved ones, if you're here and you're a son or daughter of the king, there's security in that. There's security in that. And whenever the enemy presses in hard and reminds you of your past, you only need to remind him that you are a child of the King of kings and Lord of lords. And there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you only need to remind yourself that in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Romans chapter 8. So if verses 1 through 3 could be called the realization of Jesus, verses 4 through 10 could be called the full extent of Jesus' love. I invite you to look at verses 4 and 5. I love the wording there. And if you're using a more formal translation of the text, such as the ESV or the King James Version, you might see the words laid aside to describe what Jesus does with his garments. And this wording is designed to draw our attention to passages such as John 10, 15 through 18, where Jesus lays down his life for the sheep. And no one takes Jesus' life. Rather, he gives it up freely for the sheep. Well, perhaps 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, which reads, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Now, how contrary to the things of this world is that verse? How countercultural in our society that says it's all about me. I come to church for me. I'm going to get mine. Jesus calls you to the exact opposite. He says, that's what love is. And in our society that's trying to define love with whatever we want it to be, Jesus says, this is true love. And I'm going to model that. But you know, verse 4 reminds me of Philippians chapter 2. Specifically verses 5 through 8, which read, Having this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Did you catch that? By taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient, even obedient to death on a cross. And we notice in verse 5 that Jesus poured water into a basin, but more importantly, we see the necessity of being washed in verses 5 through 10. And if you're with us on Wednesday night on a regular basis, you would have heard me say something to the effect that the biblical writers use language to draw your attention to other passages. And I believe verses 4 and 5 are an example of this, as this goes back to the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. Specifically, verse 12, and there that passage notes that he poured out, he, meaning the Messiah, the suffering servant, he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sins of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. And I hope you understand that Jesus is about to pour out his life, but he starts with pouring out water in which to clean his disciples. And there's a principle here that I think you and I can pick up on. You see, Jesus starts with a physical touch. 
before he teaches, he touches. Do you realize that from the text? See for yourself, before he teaches, he touches. Notice up to this point, John only records the actions of Jesus. The teaching comes later. And how tragic it is that so many of us do the exact opposite when trying to win people to Christ. We go around and we beat people over the head with our Bibles, neglecting the homeless guy down the street who just needs a sandwich. God, forgive us. And you say, Pastor, are you saying we should never share our faith? No. Obviously, I'm not saying that at all. But here's what I am saying. The time for teaching will come. It'll come. And if the fruit isn't ripe, don't pick it. But my call to you today is to be people of action, to be people of service. And this is how Jesus prepares his disciples for the things that will transpire. Action first, teaching second. Apply that to your life, church. Receive God's word to you today. We see in verse 6, the time for teaching has come. Because Peter starts to raise his objections. You see that in the text. And notice how the conversation goes in verses 6 through 10. Peter says, Lord, do you wash my feet? Verse 7, Jesus says, what I am doing, you don't understand now, but you'll understand afterwards. Verse 8, Peter replies, you shall never wash my feet. Now, a couple weeks ago, we talked about Thomas and his personality, Tom, doubting Thomas, and I kind of said, you know, I think he gets an unfair rap, you know? But you ever notice Peter's personality? I love picking it up in the gospel. He's Mr. Know-it-all, right? Are you like that? He's like, Lord, I know you're Lord of all things, but I got a better plan. You're never going to wash my feet. And look at Jesus' answer. He says, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Now, that's an incredibly hard statement, church. That's an incredibly hard statement. And look at Peter's response. It's almost comical. Verse 9, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Talk about a complete 180. My man went from nothing to everything and in a hurry. He's like, do it, Lord, all of me. What are you doing stopping at my feet? What an incredibly hard statement, but he does a 180. And in verse 10, I want you to see, Jesus says to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean. But not every one of you, Judas. Not every one of you are clean, Judas. Now, quick reminder, quick question. What was the condition of Judas's heart in verse 2? Betrayal. Satan had already put betrayal into the heart of Jesus. But before we press on to verse 11, I, I kind of want to nerd out on verses 6 through 10 for a moment, if you would allow me. Notice how many times in the text the word washed or bathed comes up. And I, by my ESV Bible, it's, it's 10 times, I'm sorry, it's 6 times in 4 verses. And notice the distinction in verse 10 between bathed and washed. And these are two different words. They're two different Greek words, luo and nipto, but I'm not going to go down that road. Rather than doing a word study, I'll just sum up verse 10 like this. The Christian life should be marked with ongoing confession and repentance. The Christian life should be marked by ongoing confession and repentance. Are you going to blow it this week? Are you going to do everything perfect this week? No. Do you, are you going to blow it? Absolutely. Confess to one another. I blew it. I blew it this week. Forgive me. I turn away from that. I'm going to try everything that I can to never do that again. And then show grace when that moment comes. Ongoing confession and repentance. A Christian life should be marked with that. And if you are been bathed, I want to get back to this, if you have been bathed and covered in the blood of Jesus, you don't need to be bathed again. The blood of Jesus is sufficient one time. Amen? It's sufficient. But you do need to be washed if you intend to have fellowship. 
with God, right? You guys know the scripture where it says the, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, right? You're, uh, you're out in the fields harvesting, working, doing good deeds for the, for the Lord, pointing people to Jesus. You're dirty. You've been on the front line of the spiritual war. Go clean up before you have fellowship with God. Wash up. I mean, have you ever been to a worship service where God shows up and is absolutely rocking the house, right? And people are buying in. Hands are being lifted. You're even doing the old Baptist two-step, right? But you're standing there. You're just like, I'm not feeling it. That's that broken relationship. That's that broken fellowship. You need to be clean before you come to the table. You know, you're saved and you're still saved, but while everyone else is raising their hands, buying into worship, you're just standing there. And this reminds me of King David. King David, after his sin with Bathsheba, he was still a man after God's own heart. But what did he say? Restore to me the joy of my salvation. What did King David want? He wanted fellowship. He wanted relationship. The ongoing confession and repentance. And that's what I believe Jesus is saying here with the contrast between bathed and washed. And this is why Jesus is referring to Judas at the end of verse 10 and verse 11. But verses 12 through 15, Jesus asks a very simple question. He says, do you understand what I have done for you? And his point is pretty straightforward. If I, the Lord of all things, the standard for truth, and your teacher, wash your feet, then you should do the same thing. You should do the same thing for others. Now, I get the cultural components. If I were to ask you all to take off your shoes and socks, right, we're going to be washing each other's feet today. Some of you all are going to give me the Peter response in verse 8, right? You're never going to wash my feet. I mean, let's just be honest. I've, I've already considered this. So I thought about it. I did. Don't think I didn't. But let's settle for this. Let's settle for this instead. Verse 15. Follow Jesus' example. Jesus showed the full extent of his love to his disciples, despite their misunderstanding, despite their sins, despite all else. He showed them the full extent of his love. And that's what I would ask from you this morning, church. Loved ones, that's what I would ask of you. Follow Jesus' example by pouring out the full extent of your love to others, especially here in this congregation. And you know, I've been talking over the course of the year to my new neighbors, getting to know them and you know, learning about them. And I ask kind of a pointed question for maybe a new guy. I say, what does this community need? And he kind of turned the head sideways. And they're like, well, swing sweats? Swing sets? I'm like, no, no, no. I'm not talking about swing sets, right? What does this community need? One, one guy, just very blunt, he said, we need unity. He said, politics are getting in the way. People's intellects are getting in the way of community relationship. We need unity. Well, what if, church, what if we were in the perfect opportunity to serve the members of this community and to model foot washing for them. What if, church, we were the change that this community needed to see? What if? What if? Politics are getting in the way of relationship. People's reasoning and intellects are getting in the way of this community. What if we modeled foot washing? Stay with me. i got to continue. Verses 16 through 17, we see the reasoning and the promise. Why should we model Jesus' example? Verse 16. Because you're not greater than Jesus. You okay with that, church? Let me get your attention. You're not. I don't care who you are, who you think you are. You're not greater than Jesus, and he did it. In verse 17, what happens if we actually model Jesus' example? Blessings. Happiness fellowship, the type that 1 John talks about, 
For if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of His Son Jesus cleanses us from all our sins. Fellowship. I mean, God has really been teaching me over the last year, the last couple years, really, that the relational component, that relational aspect is more important than anything else I've valued over the last few years. You guys hear me? You guys hear what I'm saying? As I get older, and I'm, listen, I'm 37 years old. I'm not saying I'm an old guy, right? But every day that passes, I just think relationship is so much more important than anything else I've valued. I used to value physical fitness. I used to love working out, being under the bench press, hitting the heavy bag, doing all those things. Yeah, that's great, but your body's still going to break down. Right? I love spending time with my son. I love showing my wife how much she means to me. I love letting you all know how much I appreciate you. That relational component, so much more than anything else I've ever valued. Have you ever had that relational component broken? Maybe you woke up on the wrong side of the bed and you kicked the dog or, I don't know, you, I don't know, you, you snapped at somebody when you shouldn't. And although they forgave you, you still have that just awkward tension. You know what I'm talking about? That awkwardness? I hate that. You hate that? You all know what I'm talking about? Don't leave me alone up here. You all know what I'm talking about, right? That relationship broken. Yeah, 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 you're forgiven. You just sit on the couch over there. I'm going to be over here. I hate that. Service to others. Loving them to the full extent of your love is the example that Jesus said. It is. You okay with that? It is. I want you to hear this statement. One of the greatest needs of the North American church is for people to wash other people's feet. It is. One of the biggest needs of the North American church is servants because we show up every Sunday and say, God, what can you give me as if you're something special? Instead of saying, how can I serve other people? That is what this text is trying to say. The need for being washed. In Jesus' example, this church here is no different. The need that we have in this church is for people to wash other people's feet. And listen, you all want to take off your socks and shoes and, you know, put them in a basin of water. I'm cool with that. Whatever. Right? But let's just get busy serving one another. How about that? I'll settle for that. And some of you are great servants, and I praise God for you. Verse 18. I'm speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the Scriptures must be fulfilled. He who ate bread and lifted his heel against me. And I know some of y'all Baptists are stressing over that word chosen right there. But I want to point out, draw your attention to John chapter 17, verse 12. And here, Jesus is praying. And while he was praying, he says, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scriptures must be fulfilled. The scripture says that it must be fulfilled. It comes from the mouth of Jesus. And this tension of being chosen as the son of destruction is part of that. There's no way around it. But as you work that out in your mind, I simply want to point out that John's word choice of lifting his heel against me draws our mind back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And here, God lays out his game plan for the redemption of the world. And of course, it's in this passage where God tells the serpent that the one whose heel you bite is the one who's going to crush your head and give you that death blow. Verse 19, Jesus gives a warning to his disciples that this is the game plan. But why would he give away the game plan? You know, in the, in the sports world, uh, a coach, you know, like today's week one of the NFL season. I, I doubt that Uh, an NFL coach is going to go to the other coach and be like, here's our first sequence of plays we're going to run. Here's the the defensive schemes we're going to apply to the game today. He's not going to do that. But why would Jesus give away the game plan? For his glory, 
so that they would know that they can't, they can't stop him. That, he, the, that what God has ordained will come to pass. That they will believe that he is God. Jesus is saying, stop me. Verse 20, we see the dignity. We see the dignity of the Christian witness. Matthew chapter 10, verse 40 comes to mind. And there it says, anyone who welcomes you welcomed me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who has sent me. And that's the dignity of the foot washing that we have talked about. Receiving one another in the name of the Lord. Serving one another in the name of the Lord. Taking care of one another in the name of the Lord. And meeting people where they're at in the name of the Lord. Blessed are the doers, amen. Look got any doers in the house? Where are my doers at? Praise God for you. So how do we land the plane here? How do we land the plane, this text? What's our application? How do we apply it to our lives? Well, the most obvious way we do this is by showing people the full extent of your love. Get over yourself. How about that one? Right? You're not that important. Others are more important than you are. Show them the full extent of your love. Because if the full extent of your love thinks about you, what does that say about you? What does that say about you? I'm trying to be as as blunt as a shotgun here, church. Remember that love shows action. It doesn't just speak words. I can tell Kristen how much I love her, but if I don't show her, she's going to be like, I just don't see it. Don't talk about it. Be about it. Apply that principle of action first and then teaching. That's what Jesus does here in the text. He lays aside. And by the way, that, those words laid aside is the exact same Greek word for crucified. He laid aside his garments and he served. And when Peter was like, you're never going to wash my feet, he's like, time out. I want to get this through your head. Let me teach this. Let me tell you, because obviously you're not getting it. Don't talk about it. Be about it. I want to applaud those of you in our congregation who look after the more senior saints in your community. I want to affirm those of you who do random acts of kindness and buy groceries for others. Continue to do that. Praise God for you. I affirm you. Send cards. Make phone calls. Confess and repent of your sins to one another. Because the Christian life is marked by that. Confession and repentance. I blew it this week. Church, I'm, as a pastor, I'm not exempt from blowing it this week. In my family, I will blow it this week. And you know what I'm going to do? At least, if God help me to do it, I'm going to go to that person and be like, I blew it this week, forgive me. I'm going to try my very hardest not to do that again. That's what the Christian life is marked by. These things are essential But what does foot washing look like here in the context of this local church? Allow me to speak specifically to this church. It looks like being available. There's a saying that goes around the sports world. Your best best ability is your availability. You know what I'm saying? To help out in the back with all that technology. I know it looks intimidating. Barton and Alyssa do a great job. But really, it's just a few buttons. And I'm not trying to belittle you. You guys do an awesome job back there. We love you. Appreciate you. Give them a round of applause, by the way. Give them a round of applause. I wish you guys knew how many times they've they've bailed me out. For real. No joke. But your best ability is your availability. God can use you. He's gifted you. We're just going to plug you in to how he's gifted you. So, loved ones, being available is the greatest thing that you can do to grow the ministries that God has entrusted to us here at West Hills Baptist Church. I mean, we start youth group tonight. Have you realized that we have the largest youth group we've had in a decade? You realize that? We have begged God through prayer for years. Sustain the life cycle of this church. Bring young families in. Bring kids. 
And he's answered that prayer. He's answered that prayer, church. And today, we have to stand ready to receive that prayer. Receive that blessing. Receive that answer. Praise God. We've had the largest youth group we've had in more than a decade. He is good. He does answer prayers. Now, here's what I, I don't want you to think, for those of you who are already serving. I don't want you to think that I don't appreciate you. And You know, you say, well, I've made myself available. And I am serving. You're like, he doesn't appreciate me. I don't, please don't take that away. I value you. Thank you. Please continue to do that. I want you to understand that. But what I am saying is that if you only come to church to take, if you only come to church to take, your Christian walk could be hampered. Because it is better to give than to receive, Scripture says. And if you only show the full extent of your love to you, and you just take instead of give, what does that say about you? You know, it was the Apostle Paul who quoted Jesus in Acts 20, verse 35, where he says it's better to give than to receive. So in the context of the local church, Foot washing looked like availability, but it also looked like membership. You're like, membership? That doesn't make any sense to me at all. I mean, do you realize the importance of being connected to a local New Testament church of like-minded believers? Do you realize how important that is? It's essential. You're like, you've used that word a lot. No, this is essential. I mean, we just talk about the ongoing need of confession and repentance. And what better place to do that than here in the local church? I mean, I guess you could confess and repent of your sins to your Facebook friends, right? Your, uh, your Twitter followers? How's that going to go for you? I bet you that'll be brutal. Right? But what better place than in the local New Testament church where you can confess and repent of your sins to people who have poured into you, who love you, who are going to show you grace, and this is actually God's design for the church. That's why it's important that you get plugged in and you do something. That you become part of the team so that you can pour into us and we can pour into you. Have you ever been working and pouring yourself out in some regard? You're just pouring yourself and pouring yourself and pouring yourself, but you've never had anyone pouring into you? What happens? Burnout. You get burnt out. And it's supposed to be circular, where everyone in the church is serving each other so that you don't get burned out. This is God's design. You can read about it in the book of Acts, all for yourself. Don't take my word for it. But it looks like membership. It's the way that God designs it. So if you regularly come to the church and you're not a member, consider membership. And actually come to the meeting. Come to the meeting because your vote and your input, it matters. See, we have a lot going on here. Just take my word for it, I promise. We have a lot of irons in the fire. There are a lot of things going on. And you can be a part of it. You see, members actually help chart the course for the church in accordance with the will of God. Come be a part of it. But foot washing in the context of the local church also looks like making and equipping disciples. I want to say that again because for me, this is the big one. Foot washing in the local church context looks like making and equipping disciples. Did you know that alongside establishing a youth program where kids can come and grow their faith in Jesus Christ, this is my highest priority? You realize that? I mean, we budget so much in singular missionaries, and I affirm that. We're not going to stop. We're going to continue to support local missionaries. But what if, what if we took the, on average, 70 people that attend here every Sunday, and we turned you into missionaries. And we equipped you and sent you out in the name of Jesus. What would Moon Township look like? And we could do it for half the cost. How efficient. You see, every single person here should know how to show somebody their need for a Savior. And where to take them in Scripture to say, your need can be met in the person of Jesus. Look what he did for you here. Look at the Romans road. Let me show you. Every single person here should know how to do that. 
my highest priority, teaching and preaching and shepherding as an under-shepherd. You see, if we were to equip you and send you out, and it's still in your mind frame that you are a missionary, we could stop the hemorrhaging of churches that are bleeding. You guys realize, I think, last last I read was 4,000 churches in North America closed each year. It's incredible. 4,000 churches in North America closed each year. Let's stop that. Let's stop that. And take on the mentality that I am equipped as a child of God to go out and evangelize my community. Just a thought. And there's so many ways, so many more ways that you can wash feet and be a servant. Music ministry. Perhaps you want to come up and make a joyful noise on the Lord. Emphasis on noise. We're cool with that. We're cool with that. Come on up. We'd love to have you. You want to do special music? We love it. Welcoming. Hospitality. Passing out bulletins. Checking in kids. Sending thank you cards. We have a real need here. There is something for everybody. Run for church office. And this is something we're going to get into more next week, so I'm not going to get ahead of my skates here. But there's needs that you can meet, and you're equipped. And I want to invite the worship team to come up now. Because all this, it starts with the need to be made right before God. And so, I just want to ask you, church, and I don't want to show of hands, I want you to work this out for yourself. Is there open unconfessed sin in your life right now? Are you in rebellion against God here today? See, church, it starts with a clean heart. You can come to the altar and you can pray. And I would love to pray with you. I would love to meet you. If you have questions, I would love to speak with you. There's no shame. We love you. You say, well, you don't know me. You're right, but I love you. Right? I would love to come speak with you. And moreover, on your way out the door here this morning before you go, feed your face right, with lunch. We've got little pink slips out on the, the back there. It says, how can I serve? And it's got a list of ministries where we have needs, where you can just write your name and phone number and check a box. And give that to one of us. Give it to myself. Give it to Dave. Joe and Andrea, Chris, whoever, give it to somebody. Find somebody. I don't know you, but here you go. I want you to have this. Find somebody. Because there's needs that need to be met. In church, I want you to understand this. Jesus was moved to action first, and then he taught. So as we get into this sermon series, Lord, make me a servant, I pray that your heart desire would be, Lord, make me a servant. So stand Stand, we're going to sing. If you need to come to the altar and pray, come to the altar. If you need someone to speak with you, I would love to speak with you.